Good evening, welcome. Hello. Thank you for coming out on this, the certainly the coldest night of the year, I think, with braving the ice and all. Uh, my name is Matt Welton. I am the Membership Programs and Marketing Manager here at the Oriental Institute. And I'd like to welcome everybody at home watching us uh, via live stream. Um, Hello to all of you. Um, for those of you who are members here of the Oriental Institute, thank you very much. If you're not a member, we certainly invite you to join us. This year is a very special year. It's our centennial. So there is a host of special programming, uh, tonight's lecture, for instance, uh, throughout the year. And uh, just keep in mind, when you do join the Oriental Institute, you not only support us here in Chicago, but you also support all the work we do overseas. Um, so you're, you're actually, your reach is extended uh, throughout. Uh, right now, it's my honor to introduce the director of the Oriental Institute and the John A. Wilson professor, Christopher Woods. Thank you, Matt. And uh, as Matt said, thank you all for coming out on this very chilly November evening uh, for this very special lecture by James Osborne and Michaela Massa on their new fieldwork project in central Anatolia and uh, the sensational finds of their first season this past summer. James, our Anatolian archaeologist, is of course well known to many of you. James's area of expertise is Iron Age Anatolia, so that's um, roughly 1200 to 600 BCE and the Neo-Hittite and Aramean city-states with a, a particular focus on landscape archaeology, geographic information system, and the built environment, urbanism, and monumentality. James joined our faculty in 2015 and I'm happy to report was just renewed uh, with flying colors as a second term assistant professor this past summer. I had, to, I had to embarrass you with that, so. Um, James received his PhD in 2011 from Harvard and subsequently held um, a, a number, really three very highly coveted postdoctoral fellowship positions prior to his arrival in Chicago at the State University of New York in Buffalo, at Johns Hopkins, and at Brown. Um, additionally, from 2013 to 2016, uh, James served as director of the Tel Tayanat Lower Town Project in Turkey, for which he received uh, a number of prestigious grants from including the National Geographic Society and the Wenner Gren Foundation. Now, one of the um, really unique aspects of James, James's research is its remarkable scope which ranges from synthetic analyses of archaeological data in connection with his field projects to a highly technical scientific studies to more theoretical work that demonstrates an ability to extrapolate um, ancient evidence and, and recast the conceptual framework that he's created for that evidence um, in a contemporary context. And in doing so, he really offers uh, a greater engagement with central concerns of the humanities and social sciences. James, for instance, uh, expanding upon his work on ancient monumentality, um, has uh, written on the very contemporary and controversial issue of Confederate monuments in the American South. And really, it's uh, precisely his ability to engage in anthropological theory and high level a syn interpretive synthesis, uh, a skill that I would say is not universally shared among all ancient Near Eastern scholars, without losing sight of the technical aspects of data analysis that give uh, James, uh, I think, a very unique research profile and make him such a valuable member of our faculty. Additionally, James has organized four important international conferences, um, each of which has resulted in a uh, published volume under his editorship, and he is now the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Near Eastern Studies. His first authored book, The Syro-Anatolian Culture Complex, is currently in press with Oxford University Press. Uh, Michaela Massa, our uh, co-speaker, is a landscape archaeologist trained at University College London, where he received his PhD in 2016. He is currently an honorary fellow at the British Institute at Ankara, 
having served for two years previously as an assistant professor at Bilicek University. Uh, Michaela's primary area of interest is the prehistoric and the very early historic Near East. Uh, Michaela's dissertation research was devoted to establishing a conceptual framework for the analysis of exchange networks in archaeological contexts and doing so as a means to more broadly investigate the social, economic, and cultural fabric of these ancient communities. His research combines elements of social network theory, diffusion of innovation theory, landscape archaeology, and GIS-led spatial analysis in combination with a big data approach to material culture. Michaela's recent publications have considered the mechanisms of and the rationales for the circulation of a range of products, technologies, cultural behaviors across the early Bronze Age Anatolia and the Near East. And he uses Western and Central Anatolia um, as an arena to understand the process of state formation in contexts beyond the Mesopotamian core. His works include an assessment of organized violence and its relationship to developing polities and a characterization of cultural and political boundaries through material evidence. Uh, Michaela is co-principal investigator with Christoph Bachhuber of the Konya Regional Archaeological Survey Project, uh, the project that he actually co-directs with um, James, which we'll hear more about momentarily, uh, the Turkmen Karahuyuk Intensive Survey Project is part of this larger effort. So we're going to hear about their first field season tonight um, in their talk, A New Iron Age Kingdom in Anatolia, King Hartapu and his capital city. So uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming um, James Osborne and Michaela Massa. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, tonight's talk will unfold in two parts. I'm going to uh, speak for about 25, 30 minutes or so myself, then I'll hand over the podium to my friend and colleague, Michele Massa. Uh, but before I start, I just want to point out that this is the site of Turkmen Karahuik itself that I'm going to be talking about quite a bit over the next half an hour or so, the star of tonight's lecture. Um, but one of the reasons I like this photograph in particular so much is because it highlights what I think is really a truism in archaeology, which is that we really don't know uh, about 90% of the archaeological record that's still out there. This is an absolutely massive gargantuan tell, or huyuk in Turkish, that really archaeologists haven't yet properly acknowledged or even known to, uh, to have existed. And students frequently ask me, as I myself asked professors when I was a first year undergraduate, is there still anything left to be done in archaeology? And I think by the end of tonight, if there's any take home point, it's that there's a lot of work left to be done. Before I start talking about results from this summer and pre previous summers of work, uh, I'm just going to set the background of the cultural historical periods that we're dealing with here. Uh, during the Late Bronze Age, which is the late second millennium BCE, roughly 1600 to 1200 BCE or so, central Anatolia is occupied by the Hittite Empire. This is obviously just a schematic illustration. Their uh, fortunes would uh, wax and wane through time, eventually conquering much of even North Syria and the Levant. But they were based uh, centrally in Anatolia with their capital city at uh, Hattusha, the modern town of Boazkoy, which is uh, where right, the, the cursor in the middle of this highlighted circle is located. During the 13th century in particular, really when the Hittite Empire was at its height, a king of the early 13th century, Muatali II, decided for reasons that Michele will be talking about in more detail later on, to move the capital city from Hattusha to the city of Tarhun Tasha. Now, his uh, successor moved the capital city right back to Hattusha, where it remained until the fall of the Hittite Empire. But in a sense, the die was already cast, and Tarhun Tasha would go on to become, for the next 100 years or so, a semi-independent competitor, rival, uh, enemy, at some points, of the Hittite Empire. 
the kingdom is of the same name as the city. Now, unlike Hattusha, which has been excavated for over 100 years, no one knows where Tarhuntasha is even located. Around 1200 BCE, the Late Bronze Age Empire, the Hittite Empire, collapses for reasons I won't get into today, along with a regional-wide systemic collapse. And the early Iron Age, which starts in 1200, is generally considered a time of social rejuvenation. By about the turn of the first millennium BCE, when we have the Iron Age II period begin, this is when we start to see uh, the first complex polities, again, visible in the historical and archaeological record very, very clearly. For example, you have all uh, know about the Greek city-states of the Aegean world. This is when that uh, social system uh, begins to appear. You know about the Neo-Assyrian Empire, whose uh, statuary is on display here at the Oriental Institute Museum, who would go on to conquer so much of the ancient Middle East during the first centuries of the first millennium BCE. Many of you probably know of Phrygia, which is the kingdom that in the early first millennium BCE occupies central Anatolia, and sort of replacing what had been the core of uh, the Hittite Empire. They go by a couple of names. We most commonly today call them Phrygia. That's the legacy of Herodotus and Greek literature. In ancient Near Eastern texts, they're referred to as Mushka. That's the sort of Akkadian uh, name of the, of the polity. If you haven't heard of Phrygia, you may have heard of their capital city of Gordian. If you haven't heard of Gordian, I know you've heard of their most famous king, King Midas, he of the Golden Touch, a historically attested ruler who would have reigned somewhere in the, in the late 8th century BCE, uh, uh, out of the city of Gordian. And finally then, in the southeastern part of Turkey, south central and southeastern Turkey and northern Syria, is the Syro-Anatolian Culture Complex, or SAC. I know you haven't heard of the Syro-Anatolian Culture Complex because I just made up that term myself and I haven't written it anywhere. It's basically a shorthand way of trying to describe a, a social landscape that's very uh, complex and fluid, multilingual, multi-ethnic, uh, yet nevertheless sharing some certain uh, cultural patterns that we can identify as archaeologists, art historians, and, and uh, philologists. I'm not going to speak about Sierra Anatolian identity tonight. But this was the time and place that I specialized in as a PhD student myself. Uh, we know a lot about the Sierra Anatolian culture complex, or SAC, because so many of these city-states, uh, capital cities, have been excavated in major uh, long-term excavation projects, including two undertaken here at the OI. Number 13 there is the site of Tel Tainat, the ancient city of Kunulua, which was the capital city of Patina, that was excavated by the OI in the 1930s. And if you visit the uh, Anatolian galleries here at the OI today, it's remains from Tainat that are on display. In the past uh, 10, 15 years or so, number 18 there is the site of Zinjirli, the capital city of Sam'a, which has been an ongoing uh, excavation project directed by David Schloan, current archaeology faculty member here at the OI. But there's one part of SAC that uh, really is terra incognita, and that's its western extent, west and north of the Taurus Mountains there, about which we know precious little for reasons I'll describe in a minute. In fact, I've written the name Tabal there, but we don't even know what the local people living in this uh, place called their polities. The name Tabal comes from Neo-Assyrian sources and only Neo-Assyrian texts. We know what the Assyrians called this place, we don't know what they called it themselves. The Assyrian texts describe a social political landscape uh, occupied by, in some texts, even two dozen city-states, each with their own kings. These cities we can't locate on the map, these kings we can't name. We really know very little about this uh, era. So I thought, okay, well, this would be an excellent place to do um, some new research projects. Luckily uh, for me, I have two very close friends and colleagues who are working already in this exact place. Now, Western Tabal is effectively the Konya Plain, which I boxed in green here. Um, Michele will talk about the uh, local sort of geological environmental conditions, but in short, it's a very hot and dry place, but extremely productive agriculturally. It kind of reminds me of Iowa, there's just endless fields of, of corn and uh, grain. But despite the fact that this productive Landscape has made it such fertile ground for archaeological settlements. There's hundreds and hundreds of sites within this box. Uh, it's almost completely unknown during the Bronze and Iron Age, and there's a very specific reason for that, we think, which is the uh, excavations at the very famous site of Chatalhuyuk. 
uh, which is located uh, just north of that river, the Charshamba River. Chatalhuyuk, of course, is one of the most famous archaeological sites in the world, a Neolithic settlement, one of the earliest large-scale settlements in the entire world, uh, excavated by Ian Hodder. And this is a point where I should plug that Ian Hodder is coming in December to give a lecture about Chatalhuyuk here at the OI. But the outcome of that very prestigious and very exciting excavation is that it's tended to suck the oxygen out of the room. And people have this sort of conception that, oh, well, the Konya Plain, we already know everything about it because Chatelhuyuk's been excavated there for so long. But there's all of these great post chatelhuyuk uh, period archaeological sites that have not been explored at all. And that was the goal of uh, Michele and Christoph's uh, and Fatma Shaheen's landscape archaeological project, the Konya Regional uh, Archaeological Survey Project, which they began in 2017, really trying to understand the entire history of settlement in the Konya Plain from not just the Neolithic period of Chatelhuyuk, but especially through the subsequent Bronze and Iron Ages, the periods of state formation and incipient uh, urbanisms. There are hundreds of sites that Michele will tell you about in this plain. Uh, that are just begging for archaeological research to take place. And we are happy to oblige. <laughs> just to give you a sense of uh, the sort of Bronze and Iron Age black hole that is the Konya Plain, this map from what's possibly my favorite website on the internet, HittiteMonuments.com, is <laughs> showing you all of the hieroglyphic Luvian monuments that exist in Anatolia. Hieroglyphic Luvian being one of the uh, prominent language that was spoken in Anatolia during the late second and early first millennium BCE. The red dots represent texts written during the time of the Hittite Empire, the think, Hittite Empire, Hattusha, and Tarhuntasha. The black dots then representing the subsequent post-Hittite Empire period of the Syro-Anatolian culture complex. And as you'll note, there aren't any texts in the Konya Plain. But as you will see by the end of tonight, this is a result of a lack of research interest in Bronze and Iron Age archaeology of the Konya Plain, not for a lack of texts there. Indeed, the, the only texts written in Luvian uh, that we really know about that pertain to the Konya Plain are, are just right on the edge of it and right on the edge of the Krasp survey border. And that's uh, texts found at Kizilda and Karada, Kizilda meaning red mountain, Karada meaning dark mountain. Uh, all of these texts written by an individual who's long been one of the most mysterious figures in Anatolian history and archaeology, a guy by the name of Hartapu. What I'm showing you here is the first of five inscriptions by Hartapu uh, on Kizilda. This is the so-called throne monument identified by archaeologists in, I think, 1906 called the throne monument because, well, it, it sort of resembles one. And what that gentleman is touching, which he shouldn't be touching, is this uh, picture visible on the right. And that's a depiction, we think, of Hartapu uh, accompanied by an inscription that names him as such. Great King Hartapu is what this text up here is saying. Now, this has been so puzzling for scholars for a number of reasons. Hartapu is not mentioned in any other inscriptions outside of these Kuzilda and Karada texts. So we don't have any other information about him from the Assyrians, for example. Uh, so we don't know really who he is. We don't know where he reigned. We don't know why he made these monuments in what appear to us to be the middle of nowhere. And crucially here, and this is one of the mysteries that we're most excited to uh, be contributing to, there's a major chronological discrepancy here. For those of you who are familiar with Neo-Assyrian art, you might recognize uh, this seated figure as a ruler who looks almost like a Neo-Assyrian ruler from the 9th and 8th century BCE. That's art historically uh, unambiguous. But the text that accompanies it, that says his name, Great King Hartapu, looks like it must have been composed around the year 1200, give or take. In other words, it looks like there's a 400 year gap between the text and between the relief. And scholars have been dating how to, have been debating how to date this, uh, this complicated monument really since it entered the scholarly literature 100 years ago. So all of these questions are the, the types of things we're uh, hoping to answer in our fieldwork. Uh, 
And that brings us to Turkmen Karahuyuk, uh, the site that I've starred there. But right before I get there, I'm just going to show you what these peak sanctuaries look like. And that's what we think they are. They, they seem like Hartapu has created sort of religious uh, sanctuaries on the top of prominent hills. So off to the left here, this is the Mount uh, of Kuzulda, the red mountain. Here's another hieroglyphic Luvian inscription composed by Hartapu again. You can see this sort of stepped stone monument freestanding there alongside it. Off in the distance here is Karada, which is an ex uh, extinct volcano. And if you go up to Karada, which one can do, it's an absolutely spectacular spot. This is what it looks like. There's the extinct volcano uh, crater Kizilda maybe is one of these two hills right there, although I'm, I'm not 100% certain of that. The, the other, uh, Michele is nodding his head. Okay, yes, that is correct. The Karada inscriptions by Hartapu are just behind what is now a Turkish military installation, so you can't actually go visit them anymore, unfortunately. One of them just says, Great King Hartapu. One of them describes uh, a dedication to the storm god of the heavens and the divine great mountain, presumably Karada itself. In other words, the texts are telling us that these two spots, Kuzulda and Karada, are themselves divine uh, peak sanctuaries that Hartapu presumably would have been doing ritual activities at. And just to really ram that point home, today these Karada inscriptions are located in the remains of Byzantine period churches that sort of reuse the sacred architecture of the, of the uh, preceding Bronze or Iron Age installations there. So clearly these Hartapu inscriptions, both at Kuzulda and Karada here, are in religiously charged locations, but what is their larger social context that can explain how any of this was actually used? This then takes us to uh, Turkmen Karahuyuk. So uh, Michele, Kristoff, and Fatma Shaheen visited this site when the CRASP survey started in 2017 and, and 2018, uh, immediately recognizing it to be basically the largest site in the region, and almost certainly then the Bronze and Iron Age urban center of the Konya Plain. This site has been amazingly unrecognized as such, uh, despite several surveys that have taken place in the Konya Plain since the 1950s. It's somehow one of those places that has some, for some reasons that we can't quite fully explain, slipped under the radar. And you're not going to find it in scholarly literature, literally anywhere. Because uh, recognize, of course, that a site as big as this, and to give you a sense of scale, that's 700 meters for just the Huyuk itself. Uh, a, a site like this requires multiple institutions working in collaborations as a sort of a larger partner effort. So they kindly invited me to join their project, which I was very happy to do. Uh, and last summer, then, I started the Turkmen Karahuyuk Intensive Survey Project as sort of a sub-project under the aegis of the larger CRASP regional effort. Now, some people who aren't familiar with Google Earth might have trouble sort of visually recognizing what's going on here. Uh, this is then the upper city, or this is what's visible from the plane. That opening photograph was a photograph taken from maybe here, uh, looking at the Huyuk. This is a modern village of the same name, Turkmen Karahuyuk. Uh, this unfarmed land is what the villagers use as pasturage. And this very faint streak that you can just make out cutting across the plowed fields there uh, is what archaeologists, landscape archaeologists, call a hollow way. This is a road uh, that was all sort of accidentally created by decades and decades of continuous use by farmers with their flocks of sheep and so on. And it connects almost directly to another site, another Bronze and Iron Age site, eight kilometers away to the east. That's a pretty cool feature, I think. One of the first objectives of TISP was to simply model the site as thoroughly as possible. We were very lucky this summer to have Tony Loricella, who's the director of the uh, Center for Ancient Middle Eastern Landscapes, or the CAMEL Lab here at the OI, come join our project. Here he is teaching Michele how to use a drone uh, for purposes of making a, a, a three-dimensional photograph, sort of mosaic uh, of the site and a digital elevation model, work that's still ongoing. One of the, uh, but really the main effort of TISP was to characterize uh, the artifacts that still are sitting there across its surface by conducting a surface survey of especially its ceramics. Now, a site that, this, that is this big is impossible to survey in its entirety. You have to use a sampling strategy. All of these black dots are representing one 10 by 10 collection, uh, 10 by 10 meter collection unit uh, every hectare. In some places, there's two per hectare. We were able to survey about 250 of these last summer. The, this, the work is not done. There's many more of these units to survey next year. 
But as you'll see, the results were so exciting that we wanted to get uh, uh, going with publication and, and speaking like lectures like this basically right away. So this is very much a work in progress. Really, the objectives of this survey were twofold. One, to date the site through time, and two, to determine how big it was and how its, uh, how, how its site size fluctuated through time. Those were really our only uh, research goals last summer. And those I can answer very quickly. The site seems to have been occupied more or less continuously from the late Calcolithic period until the late Hellenistic period, basically 3,000 years, from about 3,300 BC to about 300 BC, an enormously long, uh, longly lived uh, city. This is showing you those collection units that produced pottery from the early Bronze Age and the, collect and the Calcolithic period. During the early second millennium BC or the Middle Bronze Age, uh, the settlement has expanded to across the entire Huyuk, about 30 hectares, but it's really during the Late Bronze Age or the period of the Hittite Empire and Tarhuntasha and the Iron Age or the period of the Sierra Anatolian culture complex that the site really explodes in size. Between about 1500 BC and 600 BCE or so, it reaches its maximum extent and it's at least 125 hectares in size, possibly more. As I say, our survey isn't uh, completed, and it really depends on how you connect the dots. If you connect the dots in one way, you get 125 hectares. If you connect them another way, you get something much larger than that. Just to give you a sense of perspective, the Late Bronze Age, as I've said, is the period of uh, the Hittite Empire, Tarkantasha, and so on. Its capital city, Hattusha, the World Heritage City, uh, is a city of 180 hectares not much larger than Turkmen Karahuyuk, as it turns out. Now, some of you uh, probably have already noticed that on the left there is our Iron Age distribution map again of surface finds. There are large gaps where uh, diagnostic pottery belonging to the Iron Age wasn't produced. I think there's a number of reasons for that, uh, especially the, the slow but steady and unstoppable ac accumulation of alluviation, which has buried the lower city under many meters of alluvium. And just in case, Michele and I were sort of scratching our heads at one point last summer thinking, are we fooling ourselves? Is the city really this big or is it not? We were sort of going back and forth, but we were uh, sort of justified in our excitement that the site was indeed as large as we uh, thought it was when we made a very spectacular discovery right on the outer uh, limits of the, the collection units that were producing Iron Age pottery. There was a day about halfway through the TISP season where as happens almost every single day on survey, a, a local farmer was curious about what we were doing, drove up in his tractor, we had a brief conversation, he asked what we were doing, we say we're archaeologists, uh, trying to date the Huyuk thought off in the distance and so on. You know, nine times out of 10 they say, oh, that's great, keep up the good work, well, see you later, and they get back in their tractor and leave, and in fact, that's exactly what this fellow did. That sounds great, nice to meet you, have a great day, got in his tractor and left. 20 minutes later, he came back, and said, you know, something just occurred to me. It's so funny, I don't know why I didn't say this 20 minutes ago, but just about 20 meters behind us right now, last year I was dredging this, what is what I would call a modern irrigation canal. I was dredging the canal so that the water could flow through it quickly. Uh, and in the spoil heap of the dirt on top of the canal, we found, I just found this weird boulder that was like covered in weird signs. I mean, I don't know, I just pushed it back in the canal, but if you're interested, it's like 20 meters away, you can go check it out. We were interested and we checked it out. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, 20 meters behind where we were standing, we found in the water nothing else than a royal uh, stele inscribed in hieroglyphic Luvian. And here's a photograph of Michele at the moment of discovery. I love this photograph because it really conveys how excited we were. I remember Michele standing on the edge of the canal looking down and saying, James, I think this might be significant, jumping into the water, unable to contain himself. And sure enough, of course, even in the water, we could tell that this was indeed a hieroglyphic Luvian text. I show this picture partially so that you can see my smiling face once more, but also because it gives you a sense of just how far away from the actual Huyuk or upper city this inscription was found. It's 600 meters away, so you have to sort of think of the upper city or Acropolis buried in what's now the Huyuk or Tel, and then 600 meters of settlement extending out towards this canal that I'm uh, squatting in there. It also gives you a sense of the depth of where the inscription was found. It's at least four meters deep. There's four meters of alluvium covering it, uh, which again is why the surface survey, the surface ceramics are so scanty uh, in number. Now, 
Uh, we'll talk about the inscription in greater depth in just a moment. For now, let me just tell you that it's inscribed, or authored, I should say, by none other than Hartapu himself, the same author of the Kizilda and Karada text I showed you earlier. In hindsight, that comes as no surprise. You can see Kizilda and Karada from Turkmen Karahuyuk. And if you are standing on the throne monument of Kizilda, where we have the seated king depiction, off in the distance to the north, you can just make out Turkmen Karahuyuk the Tell. I think you can probably make it out, but I'll highlight it there. This thin white line right there is the site of Turkmen Karahuyuk. So we now think that the, the sort of spectacular views from Hartapu's Kuzilda monument um, made it a great place for ritual ceremonies to take place. You have to sort of picture the armies in the plain um, having traveled out from Turkmen Karahuyuk, standing at the base of Kuzilda down in this field below, looking up at the king conducting his rituals in front of the relief of himself. And indeed, this is a, a fairly common um, phenomenon in Anatolian cities of the Bronze and Iron Age that they have sort of ritual processions. The capital city connected to a landscape monument uh, in the vicinity, which uh, would be a subject of, of ritually led processions by the king and by certain um, uh, you know, sacred officials. Um, this could be an excellent example of such a ritual procession where Hartapu, for example, would uh, head out from Turkmen Karahuyuk 14 kilometers south to Kuzilda, another 14 kilometers or so up to Karada and the spectacular views there. This is, of course, a speculative reconstruction, but it, it certainly makes sense and it at least ties Kuzilda and Karada in with the settlement landscape of Turkmen Karahuyuk. So, so far we've proposed solutions to several of the Hartapu mysteries that I started with. Who is he? Well, he's a local king who ruled over a kingdom in the Konya Plain. A kingdom whose name is still unknown, by the way. Where did he reign? Almost certainly at the site of Turkmen Karahuyuk, whose ancient name is also still unknown, by the way. I don't know the name of this uh, city. Why did he make these Kuzilda and Karada monuments in the middle of nowhere? Well, they're not in the middle of nowhere at all. At least they weren't to him. They were in the middle of his kingdom presumably the uh, venue for his uh, highly significant ritual processions. Now, what about the chronology of it, the when of Hartapu? That's where I'm gonna uh, turn to the inscription itself. A discovery like this is what qualifies as an archeological emergency. We had about a week, I'd say, where the Konya Archaeological Museum, who were very helpful and very uh, supportive of this work, that they gave us to just have free reign with the inscription before they had to deal with it, put it into the museum, uh, after which a whole suite of bureaucratic um, you know, forms and applications need to be undertaken in order to conduct research on it. So we needed someone, for example, who's a semi-professional archaeological photographer uh, to come right away to, uh, to work on it so that we could record it so that people who aren't able to visit the thing can still uh, read the text. Luckily, we knew someone because I'm married to a, a semi-professional archaeological photographer. That's my wife, Jennifer Jackson, conducting reflectance transformation imagery, or RTI, which is a fairly common technique now in ancient Near Eastern uh, archaeology, which keeps the camera perfectly still and steady, but moves the light source around over the course of several dozen photographs, so that instead of a, a conventional photograph like this, you can have a sort of multi-light sourced image like this one, and you stitching them together in software, you can even, with your cursor, move the light source across the text, sort of recreating the experience of seeing the text in person yourself, even though you're not necessarily uh, standing there in person in front of it. Now, this inscription, uh, I'm very happy to say, is being read and translated and transcribed by OI uh, colleagues and Hittitologists, Professor Petra Chodokhobure and Theo Vandenhout, who've been working assiduously on translating a text that they tell me is uh, unusually difficult for reasons I'm sure they will explain in future articles and, and lectures here uh, in Breasted Hall. I'm just gonna walk you through a little bit of the inscription just so that you get a sense of its significance because the content of it is also very exciting, not just its existence. So, what any student of Bronze and Iron Age archeology span of Anatolia knows is that when you have this sort of pointed triangle with a curved line on top of it, you're reading the sign that says Great King. Even I knew that and Michele knew that as we were standing in the canal the day of the discovery. What this is, when you have the winged solar disk over two 
paired, I guess I don't need to highlight it, it's already highlighted, over two paired great king symbols. What that means is uh, that cluster of signs is what Hittitologists refer to as an, as an edicule, or a, sort of similar to an Egyptian cartouche. The king's name is written inside of those twin great king signs. So we knew there was a royal inscription even that first day. But of course, we didn't know who it was. We were speculating all sorts of uh, fun back and forth, but it took several weeks before uh, Petra and Teo were able to read it for us. So let's just work through the first line of it very quickly. This top line, which is the part that's actually relatively easy to understand, we gather from uh, Petra and Teo, says, Great King Kartapu, which is interesting, the other texts say Hartapu, and actually the, his name on the second line is Hartapu with an H, not with a K. That will be something for linguists to debate for years, I'm sure. Great King Kartapu, the hero, Murshali's son, land of Mushka, who or when, probably in this case, conquered. Now in English we have a, a the word order of English sentences is subject, verb, object. Kartapu conquered Mushka. In hieroglyphic Luby in the standard word order is subject, object, verb. This is perfectly normal. Kartapu, Kartapu, Mushka conquered. Now that is in itself extremely interesting. You'll remember Mushka from the very first slide I showed you. This is the ancient Near Eastern name for Phrygia. In other words, Kartapu is claiming here to have defeated Phrygia, this, the polity of Gordian and King Midas and so on in battle. Whether we believe him or not is another question, but that already is a hitherto completely unknown military or geopolitical conflict in Iron Age Anatolia. So right away, this is tremendous, uh, tremendously informative as an inscription. The text goes on to read uh, in booster feed in, in, in other words, right to left and then left to right and then right to left. I won't walk you through these second and third lines because they're much more complicated, uh, and I'll let Professor Schrödinger and Vandenhout do that in a later time, but they were, uh, allowed us to read this inscription that they've tentatively translated as follows. When great King Kartapu, the hero son of Mershali, conquered the country of Muska, the enemy descended upon his territory, but the storm god of heaven and all the gods delivered its 13 kings to his majesty, great King Kartapu. In a single year, he placed the 13 kings, their weapons and animals, under the authority of 10 strong walled fortresses. And then the final clause, the third line, is fragmentary and more difficult to understand. Michele will tell you more about these fortresses, but there's a very interesting uh, connection between the landscape signature that he's identified and this uh, passage in the text. But in other words, uh, Hartabu then is de describing a defeat of the 8th century kingdom of Gordian and Phrygia. Uh, and portrays himself as the ruler of 13 kings that must have existed in the Tabal uh, region of the Konya Plain. Now, Petra and Teo are adamant, very certain of the fact that this inscription must date based on the, the paleography of the text, that is to say the shape of the letters or signs that uh, it's written in, to the 8th century BCE. In other words, it must then date all of the Kuzulda and Karada texts to the 8th century as well, which is, after all, the time period of the depiction of the king, the art historical representation of him. So that then solves the final lingering mystery of Hartapu. He's an 8th century ruler who probably authored all of the Kuzulda and Karada texts in the 8th century around the same time that he would have defeated Phrygia or Mushka in battle. So very exciting new developments in Anatolian archaeology just from one uh, season of fieldwork. Now at this point, I'm going to turn over the podium to my, my colleague Michele, who's going to uh, continue on with the Late Bronze Age and other regional uh, aspects of our work. Uh, well, thank you very much, James. It was uh, an amazing presentation. Uh, and I apologize because I won't be as uh, good as an orator as James was. It will be a more sobering <laughs> presentation. Um, but uh, my, the aims of the, the second part of the talk uh, is essentially, essentially twofold. One is to provide the sort of uh, sociopolitical and ecological context for what James has just uh, presented. And the second is uh, to try to um, describe a little more, a bit more in detail the kingdom of Taruntasha and propose a new hypothesis for the location of its capital, which is, spoiler alert, possibly Turkmenkarayuk. 
Um, and uh, we are basing uh, this uh, reassessment uh, on uh, a data set, an archaeological data set of um, 600 sites approximately, which we collected uh, within our uh, new survey project, CRASP, but also collecting all sorts of published um, data sets from previous surveys in collaboration with uh, your own Tony Lorisella, uh, the director of the Camel Lab here at the Oriental Institute. And uh, um, as part of the broader reassessment uh, of uh, legacy materials, we're also trying to integrate the archaeological uh, data within a, a better understanding of the um, climatic and environmental uh, context uh, throughout the Holocene. And um, numerous um, proxies uh, from the region uh, really clearly indicate that uh, the Konya Plain was one of the driest regions of Anatolia during the Holocene, and particularly in the late Holocene, which covers uh, the second and the first millennia BC, um, rainfall regimes were very similar to present. So we can use modern meteorological data to suggest that uh, the Konya Plain Oops, sorry. Uh, here um, is uh, a, just at the threshold for uh, dry farming agriculture. And because of uh, a lot of um, uh, interannual variability between one year and the other, um, there is actually uh, not much, uh, it, rainfall regimes are quite unpredictable. Um, and that would have possibly prompted uh, early on um, the development of uh, sophisticated water management practices in the region. Um, and another point that I wanted to make was that um, the Konya and Karaman Plains, which are here, are actually devoid of most resources that would have been needed for uh, by, by prehistoric and early historic communities like timber, metal, chipstone, uh, groundstone, and, 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 and the like. And therefore, this also would have possibly um, allowed or, or pushed for the creation of uh, uh, procurement networks uh, with surrounding regions. And we actually have good evidence for this already at the beginning of uh, a settled life in the late 9th millennium BC, both at Chetaluyuk and Bonjuklu. And, and these networks continue in the Bronze and the Iron Ages. And uh, without being too environmentally deterministic, uh, the, the Konya Plains landscape, they are quite restrictive. They're more restricted than most landscapes in Anatolia, and they have influenced um, settled life, um, particularly with regard to water availability, and uh, settlement choices are really clearly dependent on water. And uh, to make a comparison with you probably examples that you are more familiar with, um, our region is quite similar to, to Upper Mesopotamia and Kabur, the Kabur Triangle in particular. Um, and um, one of the points that uh, I, I will stress later is um, the, 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 the region, uh, the, the hydrological networks of the region are dominated by the Charshamba River, which is the biggest river um, of the Konya Plain, and it, a river that creates a delta in the middle of the plain, um, and it is an indirect basin, so there is no outlet to the sea. And uh, the Charshamba River is uh, almost universally accepted to be the Hulaya River in the Hittite texts, and therefore, uh, the region around it is, uh, is the Hulaya River land, also mentioned in Hittite texts. So uh, we identify four major ecological niches um, in our study area based on water availability, geomorphology, um, and, and resources. So the, the first is the alluvial basins. So the, the major is the delta complex created by the Charshamba, but also other smaller fans by uh, perennial or seasonal rivers. And then we have a narrow strip of uh, at the Piedmont of the Taurus Mountains, which are here, and the Bose Mountains, which are here, which are fed by um, numerous springs. And around these well-watered uh, areas, we have 
a swath of steppe all around. And around the steppe, we have the highlands. And uh, to, to get an idea of how uh, this landscape is constraining settlement, this is the map of all largest pre-Hellenistic sites, and they're all concentrated within the alluvium. And just as a confirmation, this, is, this graph shows um, the site size by uh, per eco um, versus plotted versus the ecological niches. And you can see here, for example, in the highlands, site size is, is very small, between two and five hectares. Uh, vice, uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum, alluvial sites in the alluvium are much, much bigger. And um, uh, so these are some of the biggest sites uh, for Bronze Age Anatolia. And particularly for the early Bronze Age, we, these are the biggest sites in Western Central Anatolia. And they are forcing us to reconsider um, our models for urbanization and state formation in the area. And I will talk a little bit more in detail later. Uh, just to stress uh, the point that uh, uh, James had already made before, Turkmen Karayuk, which is not in the graph because it wouldn't fit, is three times as big as the biggest site that we have. Uh, in the region and was uh, possibly second only to Hattusha uh, during the late Bronze Age. And another pattern that suggests us that <clears throat> the early, early onset of uh, complex societies in the area is the possible um, um, appearance of irrigation systems already in the third millennium. So this, in this map you see the distribution of sites between the Neolithic and the Bronze Age. So let's say ninth to uh, second millennia BC. And in the middle of the third millennium, uh, you see a string of sites here that occur almost simultaneously in a previously unoccupied area. And um, they continue into the, the later periods, but they are in the steppe. And um, that is puzzling. And then a couple of one and a half millennia later, then you see again the sudden appearance of a lot of other sites in the middle of the steppe where no sedentary occupation was ever there before. And our initial hypo hypothesis is that this can be connected with irrigation systems. And this is corroborated uh, by spatial correlation of most of these sites with modern canals, which you can see here. And now we have launched a, a project, a sub-project of uh, CRASP, with uh, a number of colleagues to try to understand uh, water management in the region between the Neolithic and present. And uh, we are hoping to get funding soon. Um, another uh, very peculiar pattern that we found in the area that is also connected with the process of state formation, we think, is the appearance of numerous uh, hilltop sites at the margins of the plain. And they are on isolated hilltops, generally. And uh, we, we are, of course, keeping an eye, open possibility on the fact that it could be cultic sites, but we really don't have any evidence for ritual architecture or special finds that would suggest something like that. Uh, as you can see, even from, from this uh, satellite imagery and uh, high resolution digital surface models created by Tony, uh, these have clear fortification uh, on top. Most of them have defensive architecture on top. And what you can see here is that most of them have very easy access to the valley floor. And they are, in most cases, very close to modern roads. So our hypothesis, again, is that they might be connected with um, a, a, a need to control access to and fro uh, the plains. And of course, we would like to think that uh, these, these are not uh, in the isolated sites. They seem to be coordinated in some, for, in some sort of network. And this is also co corroborated by the fact that um, 
looking at both at the distribution of pottery and at the type and, and size of the fortifications, they seem to have different typologies, different um, functions from small watchtowers that could have been relaying messages to actually strong, large strongholds that could have also been mustering points uh, for armies. And uh, what is extremely interesting is that this system seems to start already in the mid-third millennium and continues in the second and the first millennia BC. So we possibly have a coordinated system of uh, fortified sites that would have controlled and protected uh, the Konya and Karaman plains um, throughout this period. And, uh, and this brings us to the second part, of, of, of the, to the last part of the talk, which is uh, what happens in the late Bronze Age uh, during the Hittite period. Now, very, um, I, I apologize to the Hittitologist, I am going to butcher a bit the, the, <laughs> the history here. I, I, try, I try to simplify uh, Hittite uh, history in a single slide. Uh, what you, I, I just wanted to show the relationship between the Konya region and uh, the Hittite empire throughout time. So here you have the Hittite heartland within the Kuzlermak River, and here you have the Konya Plain. And at the very beginning of the Hittite kingdom, uh, we know from texts that there are several military campaigns into the Konya Plain, and some of the kings managed an ephemeral control of the region through um, royal members put in control of several city-states in the area. A hundred years later, uh, with Tilipino, we see a more stable control of the region with a network of local administrators that would have uh, referred directly to the uh, Hittite bureaucratic uh, uh, apparatus in, in the capital. And again, uh, around 1400s, this system of local administrators would have been um, reformed and streamlined into uh, a, a single administrative unit, uh, which uh, would have been the, lower, the province of the lower land, which would have covered basically this area here. And uh, even though no text is explicitly mentioning it, um, the creation of this province would have very probably um, resulted in uh, the expansion or the creation of a, an administrative center in the, in the lower land. And of course, we would like it to be Turkmen Karayuk. Of course, there is no uh, <laughs> proof at the moment, but it seems, it seems plausible because this is when Turkmen Karayuk becomes really big. And at some point in the early 13th century, as already mentioned by James, uh, Muwatali decides to move the capital from Hattusha in the very northern uh, fringe of the, the Hittite uh, empire to a place called Taruntasha, which was certainly in the lower land. It was possibly uh, within the Konya Plain, as we, we'll talk a little la later. The reasons are not really clear. And Muwatali himself uh, suggests, uh, says that it, it was for a religious uh, uh, reason because uh, of the, the god Tarunza, which, uh, which had a, a particular importance in Taruntasha, but very probably it was more to do with political and economic reasons. And it might have been to do with the, uh, the attempt to better control the newly uh, conquered areas in, uh, in northern Syria or to keep an eye, a better eye on Arzawa, which was at the time growing in importance as, a, as an enemy to, to the Hittites, and or to, con, to tap into the lucrative uh, maritime routes between the Levant and the Aegean. All of this could be actually complementary reasons. What uh, is interesting is when, after a few years, the capital was moved back to Atusha, Tarantasha retained its importance, and um, maybe a generation later, a few, a few years later, Tarantasha becomes um, an autonomous kingdom uh, under the, 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 it's a vassal state at the beginning, but then it becomes antagonist 
to the, to the Hittites in the latest moments of the Hittite Empire. Um, and we know a, 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 a quite a big deal, a, a lot about Tarantasha from uh, several treaties, two treaties in fact, uh, that the, the kings of uh, Hatti and the kings of Tarantasha have uh, agreed upon. Um, and these, these treaties describe the borders between the two states. Now, there is actually quite a lot of debate uh, on where the, the, the borders uh, pass from, uh, and this depends on the uh, textual interpretation of these treaties. Uh, so there is a camp uh, led by David Hawkins, among others, that uh, suggests that the Hulaya River land would have been a later addition to the kingdom, and that the core of the kingdom would have been across the Taurus Mountains here, while others, like Forlanini and Gurney, um, think that the Hulaya Riverland was there from the very beginning, and uh, it would have been a major component of the kingdom. And uh, uh, we tend to think that the, the latter is uh, the more plausible hypothesis. Um, and, um, and the reasons, there are various reasons, but as I, as I tried to show before, the, the, the Konya Plains is actually where most of the largest centers were, where most of the population was located. Um, it would have been able to support uh, an urban population. It was one of the largest agricultural basins of ancient Anatolia as it is today. And uh, there is a clear pattern of uh, defensive uh, structures around it. And it would have been more central, if you think of uh, a, a Hittite capital, it would, it would have made more sense to have it here than on, on 2,500 meters high mountains. And so we do suggest that the political core would have been the plains and uh, the, the, the Goksu Valley here and the Beysheir and Seydishir Valley there would have been important um, secondary nexi of, of the, the, the kingdom, uh, while the, 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 the coastal strip would have been very difficult to control because of the Taurus Mountains intervening uh, into an effective um, form of control. And um, as, as uh, James was mentioning before, the location of the city of Tarantasha has been discussed for almost a century, and many uh, different locations have been proposed, and they are marked by stars. And uh, the problem is that nine, n none of these uh, suggested locations could have hosted uh, a Hittite capital because they are too small or because they are in very marginal locations, like uh, this one here. And uh, it would have made much more sense, in fact, that Turkmenkarayuk, which is very close to several of the already suggested locations, uh, would have been the capital of Tarantasha. It is very big, uh, and it becomes very big specifically in the moment where um, the, the kingdom of Tarantasha is uh, existing, and uh, it is in the middle of the Hulaya River land, which is a component of the kingdom. And uh, the, 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 the James's survey has um, certainly proved that there, uh, there are uh, very high quality Hittite pottery um, materials there, which are normally associated only with uh, Hittite administrative kingdoms. So this is just an hypothesis, and really hope to um, continue our work there. It's all very dependent on uh, the Turkish ministry to give us permit the next years, but we will hope that we will do geophysics and we will do more research there, and hopefully to excavate as well. And um, as a last slide, to come to full circle with what uh, James was uh, talking at the beginning, um, we don't know, of course, what is the, 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 the connection between Tarantasha in the late Bronze Age, let's say late second millennium, and uh, the, the kingdom of Hartapu in the early first millennium. Uh, we don't have the name of the kingdom of Hartapu. However, uh, the, the city of Turkmen Karayuk continues uh, it's, uh, to have the, the same role as a regional center uh, throughout the period. 
And um, the fact that both Hartapu and his father Mushili used the, the title Great King, and the fact that Mushili uh, ha- used that throne name um, indirectly tell us that they were trying to refer to, to, to a Hittite ancestry, which would make sense if we think that uh, that was Tarantasha. Um, so really, that is all we have to say for today. Uh, these are the upcoming articles that we already submitted and will be uh, published in early 2021. And you can follow us, um, all the updates at our website. And we want to thank you for the attention and all our sponsors and the team. Thank you very much. And we do have time for questions. Of course. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Is the farmer who discovered the stone the one in the middle with the blue jacket? <laughs> no, that's one of our uh, Turkish student, uh, PUC students, uh, oh. a Turkish PUC student, part of the team member. Uh, by the way, sometimes uh, people understandably get sensitive about identifying individuals. This particular farmer who found the stone asked to remain anonymous, which is why I decided not to name him. That's what he requested for his own personal reasons, so that's why uh, he shall forever remain unknown. So this is mainly a question of ignorance, but what is the extent you expect of the region that Hartafu controlled? Because you mentioned that Kara, um, the Karada w- would be in the middle of his territory. And you also talked about that uh, religious procession from Turkmen Karahuyuk to uh, the two mountaintops with the regional sanctuaries. And I'm actually thinking about um, sort of around the same period in Greece where you have regional processions to um, extra urban territories and also to, uh, sorry, to extra urban sanctuaries and to sanctuaries um, on the margins of a city center controlled territory. So um, I was just wondering if so it, yes. this sure. will fall on the margin of some specific borders or just within a very, um, I don't know, uh, yeah. Uh, well, actually, that is a very interesting question, um, and uh, we don't have an answer uh, <laughs> for the answer. Uh, however, I can show you here. So this is Goluda, which is a very similar context in a way. It is on a volcano, extinct volcano, and it is a very large complex, over 100 hectares, I think, and with a lot of ritual focus and. and we believe, I mean, not only us, but scholarship believes it is a sanctuary. It is another peak sanctuary. And uh, we actually put it in between Tuana, which is this uh, a cluster of uh, inscription. It, it, it is a known kingdom, and this other kingdom here. So yes, to, to answer, it is possible that there were extra sanctuaries where um, people from different uh, political entities would gather. Um, and it is possible that uh, these peak centuries might have had a similar uh, function because we don't really know what happens in, in the Karaman Plain, which is this, I don't know why you cannot really see it now, but under the, yes, uh, the, Kar- the, the Karaman Plain is, is much smaller than the Konya Plain is here. We don't know much about it at the moment. So it could, it could have been a smaller kingdom or it could have been part of the, gra- of the greater Kingdom of Heart of we don't know at the moment. It is a possibility. Do you yeah, and I would just add that um, this sort of maximal extent of the Hartapu's kingdom that's drawn here is based primarily on the continuity, the proposed continuity from the late Bronze Age, Tarhuntasha, outlined in the regional network of fortifications uh, that Michele was talking about. But of course, the Turkmen Karahui inscription, as well as other hieroglyphic Luvian inscriptions, describe 13 kings, 20 kings, according to the Assyrian king, Shalmaneser III. So it's possible that actually what we should draw is a much more fragmentary landscape of very small kingdoms or city-states, whatever you want to call them, um, 
as opposed to sort of a large umbrella of polities like these? The, the short answer is, that, as Michael said, we just don't really know yet. Hi, thank you. That was very interesting. Um, I, it seems to me rather unusual that the hieroglyphic inscription has a raised portion and an incised portion. This might be a question for Teo and Petra more so than for you guys, but if you have a comment. Um, actually, I, I, I think really Petra or Teo should <laughs> answer that. Here's a microphone. Uh, oh, okay. um, so um, if you could go back to where we have a, a picture of the inscription. So not so much the drawing, um, although Theo actually is the one who wrote that part of the article. Um, oh, <laughs> you're right behind me. <laughs> you wanna talk about this or should? Um, it's the relief versus the, uh, right. so the first, the yeah. So that's a good image. Uh, you can see it's kind of suddenly ends Right, so they start kind of hacking yeah. out, you know, and then when you come to the like bull's head, you see it just continues yeah. in incision. And my impression is, but Theo, you know, correct me. I find the the relief that we high relief that we're seeing is quite clumsy yeah. compared to some of the other or many of the other hieroglyphic Lewin inscriptions that we have uh, throughout the area in Tabal, and especially in Karkamish. Uh, it's easy to look, you mentioned the website Hittite Monuments. If you then look at Karkamish, and you pull up the large number of images, you see beautiful high relief. So my impression would be is they tried, and they just couldn't do it. It's clumsy, and they decided to continue in Incised and the incision, the incised part, I find much better executed than the high relief. So then, of course, you need to ask you: so why in the world couldn't they do this? So one of the things that I personally have been thinking of, and that's not in the article, is how about you know students had to learn, mm -hmm. scribes had to learn how to do this. And, and of course, what we should do is wait for more findings. It's so remote; it's, it's far removed from the citadel. And if you think of Carchemish, the citadel is where you expect to find this kind of inscription. So, pure speculation, is this the work of you know, student scribes? Hmm. And we, we only would be able to answer any of that, uh, you know, that question if we find more inscriptions. Inshallah. Do you have something to add to you? Well, I, I have a strong impression that it is unfinished, that they started cutting out the designs so that a high relief is the result. And, um, and I don't think they were ready yet because as Petra mentioned, it, it, has, it looks a little bit clumsy. It's not yet really uh, totally done also for example, at the, at the beginning of the line, they haven't, or at, at the bottom of the first line, it's still uh, the, 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 the surface of the stone. And they, they have started on the, the bovine, the, the ox head, and kind of stopped there, stopped in the middle, uh, which is in the middle of a word. So, what I mean, Petra may be right about the student, I, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, but I have a strong feeling that for whatever reason, um, the whole thing was left unfinished. But that's just a hypothesis. Uh, soapstone. Well, we showed photographs of this to uh, professors here in the geology department who tell us that it's probably either siltstone or mudstone uh, which is itself unusual. Most hieroglyphic Lubian inscriptions, as you know, are done in basalt or limestone. Uh, siltstone or mudstone is a stone, a sedentary stone that's created by just the accumulated pressure of alluvium deposits. Uh, so it, already that's an unusual uh, aspect of this inscription. And if I may add, actually, because it is so soft, the fact that it's so well preserved suggests that it was not exposed for very long, probably. So 
it might suggest that it could have been discarded mm -hmm. uh, quite soon after it was completed. But I think we should. It's absolutely. Right. That's right. Mara, could you? Um, thanks. That was fascinating. It was really, really interesting. I have a question about the politics of finding something like this. So is this the first time that you are presenting this in a public fora? Yes. Okay, so in order to do that, did you have to go through the Ministry of Culture? Like, what, are the, what is the process for, I mean, because this is a spectacular find, as you've just said, Petra, and this is amazing. So what kind of process do you have to go through in order to be up there presenting this in this moment? Uh, you don't need a permit to, uh, to present in a, at a scientific uh, conference or in a lecture. You need a permit to um, publish it on uh, social media or, or a sort of more uh, public uh, um, context. Right, so we're live streaming right now. Mm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> No, I, I think you can tweet away. As Michele said, you need a permit in order to do that. Um, we have gotten that permit, yes. <laughs> Don't tell anyone what you just heard here. Uh, yeah, so I'd like to just emphasize what everyone has been saying, which is that this is very interesting and just very cool to see. So I guess in light of these like new discoveries, do you have like a plan as to what you want to try to discover next or like new opportunities this opens? Like what does the future look like in this venue? Well, we certainly have plans of what we would like to do. Uh, what we will actually ever be able to do is a whole nother issue. In the immediate term, what I uh, can tell you is that the Turkmen Karhu Intensive Survey Project will continue. Uh, uh, Michele is the larger permit holder for the CRASP project, will again apply for the CRASP permit for next year. We anticipate no problems with that particular permit application. Once the permit is granted, it tends to be renewed uh, annually. So TISP's goals for next year are to finish the collection, find out really exactly how large the site was through continued collection of the surface ceramics that are uh, in the unsurveyed collection units so far. And most importantly, to conduct geophysical uh, research. You do things like magnetometry, ground penetrating radar, whatever, that can tell us what the nature of the architecture is under the ground without even uh, putting a spade into the dirt at all. So that's the, that's the short-term goal. Obviously, long-term, both of us would like to conduct excavations at the site. That's um, something that will take several years' worth of planning and uh, permission asking and fundraising and so on. And also, I mean, it, it, it is beyond our control because uh, the, the politics of archaeology in Turkey are quite complex. So we don't know whether we can actually get the permit even if everything else is sorted out. Yeah. So one year at a time. So I found it interesting that the, the rock cut monuments are to the east and to the south of the site and the, your inscription was found to the east and the hallway is to the east and yet the agricultural plain and the sort of your analysis of the landscape and the core of the political region is to the west. Can you, can you speculate or comment on this sort of geographic orientation of the monumental landscape? Um, no. <laughs> I, I, I don't have an easy or fast answer to that. I would just point out that another thing that is oriented to the east, as you've noted, um, maybe, Michele, you can go back to the, uh, the photograph of the site from above, the satellite image. We'll get there in just a second. Uh, the western side of the Huyuk is perfectly preserved with no major gullies at all. The eastern side, on the other hand, has several very large gullies, like hundreds of meters long gullies. Now, um, archaeologists often speculate that a gully in a tell is a feature that's created by uh, preferential conditions for erosion, which is itself created by a break in the fortification system, in other words, a gateway system. 
So it looks like we have several gates on the east side of the Acropolis and none on the west side of the Acropolis. Now, archaeologists will also tell you that this assumption is often proved wrong when you excavate in one of these gullies expecting to find a gate and then don't find one. But nevertheless, it's interesting either way that all of these gullies are on the eastern side of the site and not on the western side. Also, there was another farmer <laughs> who told us, ah, there is a similar uh, rock uh, inscription here. So we, we looked for almost a day, we couldn't find it. But um, there, there were, in fact, several uh, work stones there as well. Mm -hmm. um, so one other hypothesis is that uh, this uh, inscribed stone would have been part of a gate of a lower fortification because uh, the, these work stones, sorry, uh, they were here, and from the, some of the satellite images, you can barely make it. Uh, there, is a, there is some sort of a, a shape here. So this is something that only geophysics uh, will, uh, will, will allow us to, to, to say something more detail. But yes, yeah. it could be a, a gate inscription. But you're right, there is some sort of orientation towards the east that is interesting that will have to be explored further. Um, I don't know if it's a fair question, uh, but from profound ignorance, what kind of name is Hartapu? And maybe more importantly, how does it compare to the names of the kings of Tabal? I mean, does it seem to line up with what I mean, we know uh, of those? So Hartapu only appears in these Kuzulda Karadat texts and now the Turkmen Karahuyuk inscription. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, it's a Luvian name, but we don't know much about it. It, it could potentially be from an unrelated dialect, or, or rather a related dialect of Luvian, we're unsure. Maybe if you want to speculate more about the nature of the name, then I would. <laughs> Uh, a name like Wasu Sarma, for example, which is another Luwian great king, contains the element Wasu, which means good, and Sarma is a divine name. So quite often we are able to analyze the names in the hieroglyphic Luwian inscriptions. And the, the thing about Khartapu, or Khartapu now, because actually that is a very new thing that we only thought it was Khartapu and now it turns out also to be able to be spelled with a K, no one can analyze that form. So actually there is speculation that it is a name from, uh, in a recent article, uh, from further west. And, uh, well, the problem is we simply do not recognize it as Luwian. Mursli, of course, that's a very nice Hittite uh, period name. But his Hartapu? father, that is. Yeah, his father, yeah. Hartapu, not, no. Well, we are going to end our question period because, boy, we have gone long, we could go more, but I also want to say that not only did we today see a historic and unprecedented archeological discovery, but Dr. Moss and Dr. Osborne had done something historic and unprecedented from an OI lecture perspective, and that is for the first time, we have exceeded the number of people who have joined us online as the people who have joined us live. Uh, we had uh, over 90 people come here on this cold Chicago night and 115 people from truly all over join us online for the first time. So uh, let us give some appreciation to our wonderful speakers. And Thank you everyone. And please join us for reception in the Mesopotamian Gallery. Thank you.